This is a, a place where some of the sponsors will present, introduce uh, their company and, uh, of course, announce whether they have also job openings or other opportunities so that uh, you're yeah, invited to to attend and after that so we, are, we will have uh, short talks uh, from different sponsors and after that uh, you can uh, ask your questions about uh, the companies about the recruiting process about uh, whatever you like so please start to think about questions you may want to ask so we start with mongodb and uh, you do you want that microphone yeah this is fine yeah great <laughs> thank you all thank you <laughs> My name is Michael Lynn, and I'm part of the developer relations team at MongoDB. I'm based in Philadelphia, and I'm here in, um, in Basel for the EuroPython conference. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Mon MongoDB is and um, a little bit about what we're doing here at, at EuroPython. Um, so many of you may not know, we are over four, 1,400 employees around the world. Uh, we've grown quite rapidly. Uh, we've got 40 offices, 40 plus offices around the world, and over 14,000 customers in approximately or over 100 companies. We are publicly traded on NASDAQ, and uh, that happened in November of or October of 2017, I think. 2017, yeah. Um, <clears throat> we are the fifth most popular database among all databases, whether that be relational or object oriented or other, uh, and we are the fastest growing database. And those stats come from things like Google searches, mentions on LinkedIn profiles, uh, Facebook activity, and, and Twitter, uh, Twitter mentions as well. We have uh, an offering that will help you learn more about MongoDB uh, at university.mongodb.com. It's a free platform where you can uh, register for courses and follow along at your own pace and uh, learn all about how to, how to use a, a NoSQL database like MongoDB, how to operate it, and uh, there's also certification available. So we offer a certification for DBAs uh, as well as developers. Uh, we have a Python driver. MongoDB uses drivers across all of the languages and frameworks that are available today. And for Python, we use uh, a driver called PyMongo. And we're quite fortunate to have <clears throat> one of the maintainers of PyMongo here at the conference today. His name is Shane Harvey. Uh, so stop by the booth and talk to Shane. And uh, the thing about, um, about PyMongo is it is, Py it is Pythonic. So it's written by Python developers. So they're very familiar with how, how to access and manipulate data in Python using Python. Um, it is idiomatic. It's, you're using the language to manipulate the data and the objects for MongoDB. And uh, it is very performant, last but not least, of course. And you see what I did there? Uh, it's pip. So it's a little dad joke there. So yeah, stop by the booth and, and talk to Shane. You can learn more about PyMongo and how it works. <clears throat> we also, later today at 3 p.m. in the MongoDB room, have Joe Drumgoul, who's the Director of Developer Relations for Europe. He's going to give an introduction to MongoDB for Python developers, uh, actually 3.30. And lastly, I uh, would invite you to check out mongodb.com careers if you're looking for an awesome place to work. I've certainly found the last uh, three and a half years amazing, uh, you know, just per personally enriching. I've been able to start as a solutions consultant where I helped customers uh, develop solutions using MongoDB and moved into the developer relations world. We've got openings in developer relations as well as engineering and marketing and uh, a, a whole a whole number of positions all around the world. So we're going to tweet out um, more details about the specific positions that we have available. So keep your eye on the hashtag EuroPython, and we'll mention uh, MongoDB, uh, so you'll, you'll catch those. Um, again, if you'd like to swing by the booth today, say hello to Shane. I think Joe will be there as well. I will be there. We're raffling off an Osmo, an awesome Osmo 4K action camera. <laughs> it really is an amazing device. So I've, I've been carrying it for the last uh, a couple of days, and the performance on it is, is phenomenal. It's, it's got image stabilization. It's just a really cool camera. So swing by. If you don't have a QR code on your badge, uh, then you can visit bit.ly win Osmo, and the Osmo must be uppercase. 
And uh, that is all I prepared for. Uh, do we have any questions for, uh, for myself or the other MongoDB folks? Okay, is there any already specific question for MongoDB that you would like to ask? Yep. Here. If, if we want to work in DevRel for Mongo, do we have mm. to be good at dad jokes or is that optional? <laughs> it's helpful, but not, it's not required. mandatory. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> well, she'll, she'll tell you. <laughs> I just happen to be really fluent in dad joke. I speak it naturally. So. <laughs> Any other questions? More? No, just it's don't, don't point at the speakers. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you so let's, much for your attention. let's, let's thank you. Michael. Okay, is there someone from uh, Google, from the Google uh, booth? No? Okay, then we move on. I'll go again if you want. Can we do a redo? <laughs> I just need to grab my water, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thought you want to present, you wanted to present Google as well. Okay, great. So, okay, so we have uh, Luciana and Steve for Microsoft. Woo! <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. We, we love MongoDB. <laughs> uh, hi, my name's Steve. Um, I'm an engineer at Microsoft. I've been there for about seven years. Uh, which, if you've been following us at all, you'll know is a long enough time to have seen a lot of change happen at Microsoft. Uh, I was there at the point where it took six months to get legal approval to open source a project, all the way through to now, where we can, we actually, it's faster to create a new project on GitHub and we're allowed to just go do that for the most part. Uh, I relocated from Australia. Uh, Microsoft helped move me out from uh, Melbourne in Australia to live in Seattle and work in the main office there. Uh, and that, that was just a really good experience. There's a lot of, uh, there's a huge emphasis on remote work these days, but there is something about being in the same location as the rest of your team, the people you're working with every day that helps build a camaraderie, helps build projects that just operate better. So I'm really glad that I got relocated out for that. We do have a lot of remote workers on our team. Uh, and in fact, that has grown to the extent that we have half of our team is remote, but they're all in the same building. Uh, Luciana has come along because she is one of those. Luciana, uh, tell us how long you've been at Microsoft. Uh, eight months now. Hey, man, and how was your experience of being recruited and relocating? Yeah, it's been great. Microsoft supported me uh, with all the moving process. So I am from Brazil, actually. Uh, I was a college hire, so they helped me with the process, getting the tickets, uh, with transportation, they offered help for packing and everything, and reimbursement, and uh, the visa process, everything was, was moved. Great, and Lu Lu Luciana works in our Vancouver office. We have, uh, how many people do we have working in that office now? That's growing huge, isn't it? It's growing big. I don't have numbers. It's, it's basically so many remote people there that it's, it's, I think we have as many people in the Vancouver office working on VS Code as we do in the Redmond offices, uh, which is a lot of fun. But how, how has being remote impacted your ability to work with the team? Have you felt like that's, like, is Microsoft making an effort to make that work well? Oh, for sure. Uh, I work in a, we have people living all spread up around the U.S. and uh, we have people in Vancouver office and Redmond office. It does help that Vancouver and Redmond are close, so we can see each other every three or four months. But the remote culture is great. We're doing a very good job. Thanks, Luciana. And of course, it's not just U.S. based. We have development offices all around the world. Uh, we've recently opened one in Africa, which is the first in that continent. We're very excited about that. There's a number of offices throughout Europe. Uh, and relocation is not required for a lot of roles, but that is something that we do encourage. We do like to have our people working together. Uh, so if you are interested, that's something to consider. Or if you want a change of scenery, uh, this might be a very easy way to get some assistance with that. I'm not going to list off all the job openings we have right now. There are literally thousands of them, but I do want to provide two tips if you're at all interested in looking into it. If you're early career, if this is uh, first job, first or second job out of school, I would strongly recommend go to the careers site. There's a section for you to go through that will get you in touch with our recruiters. They're really good at working through and finding you a role that may suit things that you're good at. Microsoft's also very good at internal transfers. You can start in one role and at any time move to another within the company. We make that very simple. Uh, we, make that, we actually encourage that. We go out of our way to encourage movement between roles to make sure that you don't get stuck in one place for a long time. 
If you're a little later in your career, you know your specialty, you know your skills, you know what areas you want to grow in. Again, go to the site. There's a really advanced search form there where you can filter by anything you may be interested in, location, where you want to be working, what kind of role, what kind of aspects to that role. There'll be a position for you. Uh, feel free to come by the booth and we can help you navigate that and find it if that would be helpful for you. Uh, and again, all the same criteria apply. Once you're in, freedom of movement within the company is very easy. And as you probably know, Microsoft works on virtually everything these days. If you want to go from operating systems to gaming, to developer tools, to platforms, to web services, all of that is totally available to you. Uh, we'd love to have you there. Thrilled to see you all at EuroPython. Hope you have a great conference. And come by and chat with us at the booth whenever you feel. Thanks. Thank you very much. There were already lots of questions and answers, uh, internal questions and answers. Uh, is there anyone who wants to ask right now a question specific for Microsoft? The MongoDB <laughs> replies that strikes back. Uh, or, <laughs> genuine questions. <laughs> So uh, my name is Cesar. Um, how do you increase your chances of uh, somebody actually replying to your mails? Because I mean, you have <laughs> openings, and then of, of course I assume thousands of people apply, and then you are never the the one that gets picked. So how do you increase your chances of being uh, somehow yeah. uh, selected? Bribery. <laughs> uh, bri bribery does not work, uh, <laughs> and unless you happen to find. So, so there are, uh, one thing that I will particularly say for the European audience, if you're applying for, for jobs in the US, uh, and I say this as an Australian who, who was also somewhat surprised by this, if you're applying for jobs in the US, Americans assume that you're exaggerating on your resume. Like they just assume it. Like, and, and, and equally, Americans exaggerate on their resume. So it works out about even for domestic candidates when you go, oh, they listed seven languages, let's assume that they actually know three. Uh, but people from outside the US tend to minimize their achievements on their resume and don't actually sell, we, we don't sell ourselves as well as we really ought to. Uh, and when you factor that in with the Americans going, oh, they're probably exaggerating, you, you really need to list all of the things you do when applying to an American company to not get filtered out early uh, because of that cultural difference. Uh, that was something that surprised me, uh, and and you know, honestly disappointed me a little bit because I you know I come from the minimize myself. It's like I'm I'm good at Python, so I'll put that one down, and good at C sharp, and I haven't touched C plus plus in like two weeks, so I'll probably leave that one off. That's not how Americans do it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I saw a book in a bookstore once on JavaScript, so now I'm a JavaScript developer. Uh, is fuck? Well, that's not a thing against JavaScript developers. That's I, it's a thing against Americans, yeah. Uh, but, but, but definitely sell yourself. Like, you do need to go, it's particularly if you're from uh, European culture, or a lot of European cultures, I'm not going to assume all of them, but certainly a British background culture, uh, you need to uncomfortably sell yourself uh, just to get past that first step. It helps a lot if you know someone on a team you want to be working with, and certainly if you're more senior and applying for specific roles, that can help. Uh, but at the same time, it's just keep on at the people who should be responding. Once you get in touch with a recruiter, keep on at them. Just keep pinging them and saying, are you able to help me? Have you heard anything back? Uh, it can take a bit of work. It can take a bit of effort. Uh, as you say, there are a lot of people applying all the time. We're also hiring a lot of people all the time. Uh, like there's been one or two people hired since I started talking. So there's, as long as you keep on at us, then we'll try really hard not to lose you. Just people watching the yeah, so with that, with that fast-paced growth, um, maintaining culture is always a challenge. What does Microsoft do to maintain a good, solid working culture when you've got so many new coming, incoming employees? Yeah, uh, the amount of effort that goes into uh, building that culture and, and uh, really, really active kind of training that goes on. There, there's a lot of... Uh, training and career growth that is highly encouraged and actually required at certain levels. Um, I, there are definitely promotions at the moment for higher level uh, engineers and managers that will be blocked if they haven't taken certain trainings. Uh, and so it is a very active approach to making sure that 
everyone is aware that we're building a culture and trying to keep that going. There is also, it's a, it's a big overall number, like 100, what are we, 110,000 employees is a very big number, but it breaks down quickly. And so you do end up in like a division or a group that is going to have some aspect of its own culture that varies from team to team. Windows team does not look and feel like the Xbox team, for example. Uh, and so because of those kind of subcultures going on, it's not actually as big a problem as how do we deal with all 110,000 at once. Okay, we have another question. Yeah, I think it should work. The Sorry, Steve, if I, I'm, I'm a bit late to this meeting. Have you listed all the, uh, could you list all the Python related projects that Microsoft does? <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, you know, so, 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 so three years ago, all the Python related projects we had were Visual Studio, we're just starting Visual Studio Code, uh, Azure, Azure App Service, um, all, all the Azure SDKs, uh, Cortana Analytics Suite, no, Intelligence Suite. Uh, this was three years ago. At this point, I can't do it. Uh, there's literally hundreds of projects. Basically, every single division in some way is touching Python, whether it's uh, implementing production stuff in Python, uh, developing libraries for users in Python, uh, developing developer tools for Python developers, uh, doing data science on their telemetry, analytics, whatever is coming in, uh, using it for testing, using it for security enforcement, using it for system administration. Virtually everything you can do with Python is being done somewhere at Microsoft, and the number of projects is beyond me. And, 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 and sorry, I'm throwing these ball, softballs at you. Uh, in terms of Python contributors, who do we have at Microsoft? I did miss that earlier. We, we also contribute to open source. I mentioned that the culture has changed drastically in, in my seven years there. Uh, at this point, we employ four core developers on the CPython project, so I'm one of them. I get allocated time to contribute to CPython. Uh, two members of the Python Steering Council, Brett Cannon and Barry Warsaw, are also working at Microsoft right now and both get time to contribute to Python, as well as Eric Snow, who is, is also allowed time to contribute. There's a few other people who are also contributors that are not core developers right now, and some people that we're actively mentoring uh, to be contributors to various projects out in the open source community. Uh, some of the other projects we contribute to that you may have heard of, uh, Linux, Electron, um, well, there's, there's another big one. What's the other big one? Sorry? Sorry? SQL. SQL. Uh, SQLite, yeah. There's, um, and all of our own open source projects that everyone gets to contribute to, uh, it's a very radically different place from where we were even a few years ago. Okay, I think we have to move to the other sponsors, but uh, if you have more questions, we will have more opportunities at the end of all talks. So let's uh, thank again Microsoft, Microsoft team. Okay, so next one from Kiwi. Oh, well, it was this one, that's okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lajoslav. I'm working in Kiwi.com. Uh, and I'm curious who never ever heard about us. Can you raise your hand, please? So we have a couple of, of you, that's good. Uh, so what we are doing, what we are, uh, well, we are a revolutionary flight search portal. Uh, you can find it on the web, Kiwi.com, obviously. And what we did, well, we were the first one who managed to combine the flights from non-cooperating airlines. Uh, what does that mean? That now if you go to our portal and search from city A to city B, we will try to find you almost all the possible combinations of flights coming from that city to that city with some layovers. The idea behind that was that uh, in, the, in the past, the classic carriers were pretty expensive. And if you were searching for, for flight tickets, for, in our case, it was Prague to Porto, uh, the direct flights with the classical carriers were super expensive. But back then, like seven years ago when we were founded, um, low cost carriers started growing up. So we had an idea like, let's connect some flights. And eventually we find road through, I think that was Dublin back then, uh, which was like half of the price of one ticket. And we had to transfer to uh, back then, it was our CEO and his wife. So we combining all those possible, possible flight tickets for you. Plus on this, we give you we give you a guarantee because otherwise you can always like book these flight tickets elsewhere. But you, for uh, for example, in longer trips where you have free flights, 
you have to buy free flight tickets on separate sides of, of the flight carriers. In our case, you can buy everything in two minutes on one side. If the first flight got cancelled, delayed, something happened, we will get you to the final destinations on our own costs. Uh, and plus, we are adding also ground transportation to our search engine, so you can now find there some uh, flight um, train companies, bus companies, and so on and so on. Uh, majority of our backend is built in Python. That's why we're supporting Python conferences like this one. Uh, only the search engine itself is written in C++ and Go, thanks to the speed. Frontend React, some components in React Native, mobile apps and native languages. Uh, we are searching for Python developers, as everybody here as well. Uh, you can find our jobs at jobs.kiwi.com. Uh, and we have offices, like our main offices in Czech Republic, but we also have offices in summer vacations, destinations like Barcelona, Split, Zagreb, and so on. Um, we also have a competition today, uh, as we are a travel company, so let's win some flight vouchers. Uh, if you check the QR code or go to the page meet.kiwi.com, you can join our competition or just stop by at our booth. We are downstairs and have a chat with us how to win something and how to connect and cooperate. Okay. Thank you very much, Vladislav. <laughs> Any specific question for Kiwi? Not really. Okay, see me at the booth. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, running, then next one. Numberly, Alexis. Hello. Uh, so I'm Alexis, um, I'm CTO at Numberly. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the sponsors for this year. I'm really happy to see uh, Mongo. I'm uh, really happy to see uh, Microsoft, Google back as well. So I think it's good to support the, the conference. Uh, we've been supporting uh, this conference for quite a while now. Uh, so some of you may discover us for the first time. Um, and Ki Kiwi as well has been uh, around for a while. So it's pretty cool. Um, depending on the year, this, uh, this, uh, this room is uh, full of full um, web developers, backend developers. Uh, the latest years, I see more and more, and we see more. Is it me? OK, thank you. Of uh, data science or data thing. Uh, people, which is great because we are a data marketing company. So we've been advocating for the importance and the value of the data uh, for a while now, uh, almost 20 years. Um, so it's pretty cool now that we can have a conversation over uh, data and uh, its regulation, usually as well uh, as, uh, as data uh, subjects. Um, but as well as how it's being used and why, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the meaning of data as uh, has, uh, has moved a lot and it's continuing to move a lot. So uh, if you look at the schedule of this year, I guess it shows a lot as well of how Python has come, uh, has come and what it is becoming, let's say. So, uh, so it's pretty fun uh, to see. Um, usually uh, I, I won't get specific numbers of things and clusters and stuff like that uh, that, that, uh, that could uh, happen as well. Um, the last thing I want to say is usually you're looking for an environment. Uh, the place that you would like to be working is actually made of people. So it's more about the people you, will, we, you will be working with. Um, that's what matters at the end, no matter what kind of job you're looking for. Um, and that's basically it. You can find us at the booth. Uh, uh, downstairs, we are next to Kiwi, which is pretty cool, um, and uh, we have uh, we have our um, fun game that we are having every year for for a while as well. So you can win some <laughs> fun stuff. Uh, so yeah, look us out uh, numberly.com, and uh, we do we do data. So 
basically you 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 have a good idea of what it is that's all thanks but this is not working yeah is it okay is there any question doesn't really is there any question specific for uh, numberly MongoDB has lots of questions for other teams. What's your mascot as Numberly? Do you have one? We have a lot, actually. What's your favorite one? <laughs> I'm working on a joke. This is really important. Uh, I can't have one. <laughs> Every tech team has one. So um, mine. Well, um, unfortunately, as a CTO, I don't have one of my own. That's the, that's the bad luck that I have. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, and why I I, while I'm talking with MongoDB guys, I want to, to thank them for PyMongo because it's a great driver, you're, you're right. It's usually the, the one that advocate as the best to interact with the, uh, with the database. And uh, I've been in contact with Bernie and, uh, and Jesse for a while as well um, because I have an open source life as a Gen2 Linux developer. So. That's uh, that's uh, that's uh, pretty cool. And the, there's one word that was missing on your slide: is it's a resilient uh, driver, and it's very good at handling this. So maybe you can add it to your slide. Okay. 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 So yeah, we use a lot of NoSQL and big data thing clusters, of course, because we deal with we we deal with data. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexis, for number leap. Okay, do we have uh, someone from uh, JetBrains or Nexmo or Yelp? Okay, great. So we thank the sponsors that uh, have participated today, but uh, let's now open also if you have uh, general questions that you would like to, that you came up later, that you would like to ask to anyone or even on the general uh, recruiting process? Any jokes? No jokes. <laughs> Anyone? OK, maybe I'll ask then. I'll start to ask, uh, can you say something more about uh, what's the actual recruiting process uh, in terms of uh, steps, uh, skills? So what are you actually looking for in, in different stages of the process? How long does it actually take, uh, the whole uh, process typically? It great, greatly depends on the individual process or the, uh, the, the individual team that you're got, getting hired into. Um, but it is, um, it's team approach. So we have, uh, we like to give the, the recruits the ability to not only meet the hiring manager in the process, but meet individuals from the team that they'll be working with. Um, we think that's, that's important to, to kind of make sure you're going to be working with people that you can get along with. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Oh. For developer relations, we work pretty quickly. So it's like a two to three week turnaround or less. We recruit on Twitter. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Microsoft, for the most part, the starting point is going to be going through the career site. Uh, on very rare occasions, we'll find someone outside of that process. And normally, the first thing we get them to do is go back to the career site and get all their details in the system. Otherwise, people tend to get lost. Um, from there, it really varies based on team, uh, work location. If we're going to help sponsor any visas for you, then that can dramatically adjust how long it's going to take. Um, the shortest, so I, th I know for university hires, we typically see kind of nine to 12 months uh, between when we'll go to uh, like hold recruiting sessions at the universities and say, you know, yes, we want you through to the offers being made and people actually starting. Uh, for later for more senior positions, it can happen quicker. It really depends on the team need uh, and whether you know, accounting and HR has actually let us hire someone yet, or if you know if they're still arguing about things. Um, I don't know, moving beans between different lines. I don't know how that works, but occasionally that holds things up. Uh, so it really varies by team. But as a candidate, the best thing you can do is get into the recruiting system as quickly as possible and keep moving things along by just pinging whoever your contact is. And on our side, the time frame is uh, between one week and three weeks uh, total, whatever the, the position, unless you are 
applying for a directorship uh, maybe it takes one month max mm -hmm. um, and you will meet the, the first people that you will see are actually uh, tech people directly so you, there is no hr division uh, per se uh, at least not call, we, we don't call it that way so and um, so you would just be seeing like two minimum is usually three between three and five peop different people that doesn't mean it that it will uh, be turned into three or five interviews right so do we still have exactly the Kiwi representative? No, I think I don't see him anymore. Okay, so just for the people who just entered, we are asking questions now to Numberly, Microsoft and MongoDB, general questions that you might have on recruiting process, profiles, anything. Any new question that came up in the meantime from anyone? Here, great. Does any of the companies here do uh, whiteboard coding uh, sessions for uh, recruitment? Yes, I love your questions. <laughs> for whiteboarding interviews, that's really hard to test for to see if those tests are passing. So no, we don't do whiteboarding. Uh, our, our interview process tends to be uh, very much up to the individuals who are interviewing. Uh, it varies a different, again, depending on the role. Uh, for, a for a more senior developer role where you're interviewing directly with the team, there's a very good chance that you'll be asked to do some coding on a whiteboard or you'll be asked to do some coding in a text editor on a screen share or something along those lines. Uh, it very much varies by team uh, and by individual. The, we are very explicitly trained that if it's, it, can, it cannot be a pass-fail test. And the feedback that we give at the end of an interview after we've done that part of an interview uh, is basically intended to be more, more detailed about the process and, and um, the problem solving that went into it. So even if there is a whiteboard coding thing, if you miss a semicolon, then that's not a failure. And if that is a failure, please let your recruiter know that that interviewer did a really bad interview and they need to be corrected on that because we don't approve of interviews like that. Um, but it is largely left up to the people doing the interviewing what they think is important for the person joining their team. And so that certainly coding skills do come up and do get tested in various ways. Uh, so that, that may happen, uh, but it should not be the bad ones. So yeah, I, so my interview process, um, I, there were four people that interviewed me. Two of them uh, was with whiteboarding coding, but the focus of the interview was not the code itself, was my reactions to their feedback. So they were more like concerned about how I, re I would react when they criticized my code or they pointed failures and things like that. So they, it was not the focus like on the coding itself, it was more soft skills, I would say. Short answer is no. Um, and no, we, we, we have a discussion, that's all. Okay, more questions? Yeah. So, um, I don't know about over here, but in the US, people are working more remote outside of offices. Um, are you guys seeing that and are you guys embracing that? Um, I, for example, work on the East Coast while my whole team's in California. Um, and I've turned down numerous recruiters because they want co-location and I'm not willing to move. Um, I don't know if you guys are seeing that or... So I think that was mentioned already for Microsoft, but um, we'll hear also for the others. Start with Lam. There's a worldwide shortage of engineers, whatever you call them. So I find it harder and harder to have a company that is looking for talented people tell you that they don't do it, or they do not allow it, or they are not embracing it. So I guess this is true, the, the, the truth for every one of us, of course. Uh, 
if you're recruiting people, then you want to work with them. So wherever they are. But then there's the cultural uh, aspect that has to be preserved uh, to, because it's not about only what you produce. It's uh, also about why you're producing it. So this is the balance that you, you will be, or we will be also looking for. And there are numerous ways to make it work with remote people, of course. So, yes. Do you want to add anything on this? Uh, so, so I did answer a bit earlier on, on the question of culture, and we do think that cultures, uh, team cultures are easier to build when people are co-located, uh, at, at least to some extent. We do have remote offices where there'll be a group of people that are remote from the rest of the team, uh, but we are trying to keep some co-location going. There, there are certainly exceptions from time to time to that kind of general rule, and from time to time can be quite often for some teams. It comes down to whether the team is prepared to have more remote people. And in general, once a team has a few, it's easier to have more because it's not going to be as disruptive for suddenly your co-located culture has to change completely to accommodate the one new remote person, which is a very dramatic change for a team culture. Uh, but we, we do have that in, vari in various special cases. And what I will say is those cases uh, we consider working remote as part of the negotiation process for the most part. So even, even if a job doesn't specify it, you can still apply for that job. If you think you're perfect for that job and that's the perfect job for you, but you need to be remote for whatever reason, I would say still apply for that job. If the team agrees that you are perfect for that job and you are negotiating that I want to be remote, then there are things that the recruiters can trade out to make that work. Uh, or negotiate, but if you rule yourself out right at the start and say, this job does not say remote, and so I'm not even going to apply for it, then you're just cutting off your own opportunities. So I, I would save that negotiation for, uh, for, like, if it's the perfect job, apart from that, go for it, and then figure it out at the end. And if it means you miss out uh, because the team is not able to accommodate it, that's unfortunate, but at least you didn't rule yourself out before we had a chance to say, yes, we really want you badly enough that we'll adapt the team to have you. Great, thanks. Want to add anything or? Yeah, yeah. So hi, everyone. So uh, my name's Sung. Um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, as far as MongoDB, so we highly encourage a distributed remote team. And I think we go and jump through as many hoops as possible to make, you know, I think to, to what you're hearing here, the culture something where you do feel included and comfortable because I think there is an element of being able to be productive and produce things and um, do your job from remote locations. But I think some of the things that then you end up missing is um, kind of the team building, um, the socialization, being uh, able to you know feel like part of the group and uh, be a part of conversations and also have input uh, into decision making, et cetera. So all those things I think we um, try and encourage and, and uh, make um, remote uh, I guess employees feel comfortable and included. Just to give you a sense, uh, so we're just about 1,400 people, a little over 1,400 people. Our headquarters is in New York. The majority of our engineers, we have about 350 engineers in New York. So, so put that in, in kind of context to now, we also have engineers in Sydney. Uh, we have engineers in uh, Tel Aviv, um, some in Dublin, uh, distributed uh, around um, uh, Europe, also in, um, I guess now with Copenhagen, Copenhagen. Uh, as well as both East Coast, West Coast, and Austin in uh, the U.S. So my point there is we do have a distributed organization across uh, even all the functional areas within MongoDB. So it is something that we highly encourage. And I think it's not like 10 years ago where we didn't have all the tooling, even though you probably shouldn't use Zoom anymore. I don't know. Just kidding. Um, but I think there's a lot of tooling. There are a lot of things that allow um, all the benefits of being remote, but also still feeling like you're included and, and a part of the team. So... Uh, at MongoDB, that's part of our culture. So, hope that helps. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I have actually a question. So, especially for uh, large uh, companies, I've uh, always, uh, well, often, let's say, been told or uh, read that, uh, especially in very large companies, uh, one challenge might be that uh, you're working on a very specific thing and you lose a bit track of what's the overall. Uh, uh, purpose, uh, let's say, or, or goal or objectives of the team, or you have less responsibilities uh, in the sense that uh, you're very focused on your specific task. So would you think that uh, that's a challenge uh, for your companies? And uh, how? what's your tip uh, for, for that, to address that? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. 
So, so uh, I mean, we are a uh, not a huge company, like I mentioned, 1,400 people. So as an executive team, uh, our CEO, CTO, COO, CFO um, all have monthly town halls where we talk about um, our fiscal year objectives, how we're measuring against them, always getting a business update uh, since we're now a public company, but also any product updates, roadmap. So it's one way to kind of coalesce. And again, even for remote and employees that are um, in the office locations to get a very monthly kind of sync and update on how the company overall is doing. That's number one. Um, some teams use OKR, some teams don't, but we all have a very clear view as far as here, the fiscal year objectives at, at the company level, the strategic ob objectives, how we measure them, and then also how each of the respective functions and teams uh, are doing. So at any point, everyone should feel like and know the work that I'm doing affects this a specific initiative or objective with the company, whether it's a roadmap or product related, et cetera. So it's something that we try and, again, kind of build and ingrain into the company culture. And it's something that I think works pretty well for us. Thank you. That's very good to know. My, my favorite story from Microsoft on this was when I met the person who was responsible for the paste button in Microsoft Word. Uh, Turns out that's actually an incredibly complicated feature. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever clicked on the drop down below the paste button, but there's about 30 different things in there. Uh, but it's, yeah, there, there are some places where you can end up in a very oddly specific narrow zone. Uh, and if you're not careful, then you, you can get buried down uh, in that and not have a lot of insight into the rest of it. Uh, those are getting fewer and fewer. Uh, as, as a company, we're becoming a lot more agile uh, we're doing a lot more things in a quicker time frame and getting them out. We're shortening the feedback loop on everything. And that really necessitates people having a broad view. Uh, I will pass to Luciana in a sec so she can tell you about her experience here. Uh, but one thing that has been, I think we've had it going for about two years now, is every level of management uh, from vice presidents on up does a monthly Q&A session, or like monthly to quarterly Q&A session. I think Satya only does every three months. Uh, that's, a, that's an open question for anyone at the company whose reports up through that person to ask any question they like. They can get very candid. Uh, and quite often, there's no preparation for the, the executive who's answering. And so that's one way that there are opportunities provided for you to keep tabs on what's going on as a company. There's certainly company-wide emails that come out about major events to keep people engaged. You can opt out of that and ignore all of that if you like. Uh, but if you do want to maintain that perspective and that interest in everything that's going on, you certainly can. Uh, and as far as knowing everything that's going on. Yeah, I was going to mention the monthly uh, Q and A's with executives. It's really helpful. Um, it's all broadcasted on, um, so like stream, streamed. So even remote employees can act, can watch it. Like you said, you have the option not to, but it's usually very good to keep track of these things. Uh, the divisions also do like all hands event. They also try to accommodate uh, remote employees. Um, so that, that always keeps us on track with the object, objectives. I could relate a lot to what you said uh, about MongoDB. It happens a lot in our, uh, at Microsoft as well, so far as I experienced. Oh, for sure, <laughs> for how, sure. How much of your product do you own this year? How much of my product? Yeah. It's kind of hard to measure, right? Because <laughs> you have the data science part, yeah, let's say. Basically all the time you support your code? Not all of it, but 75% of it. <laughs> Thanks, you want to add? Yeah, there are both quite large American-based companies. So maybe for Europeans, you didn't get the OKR, acronym, which stands for Objective and Key Results, uh, which is a method uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is used to uh, uh, define, let's say, uh, and, um, your objectives and, uh, and then measure them over the time. So it's, uh, it's, it's slotted over time and it's, it's just a method, okay? Organizational method. Thanks. Actually, how... Uh, do you work with the agile uh, management or you do, no? You are, okay. I see. Agile, Scrum, whatever. Uh, see, 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 similar. <laughs> okay. There are sprints. <laughs> there is another question here. We have five more minutes. 
Hi, I'd like to know if it is possible to apply directly to the company, say, instead of applying to a specific role or team. Because uh, I've heard that uh, some companies, especially the big ones, once you go through all the stages in an interview, they will recommend you to actually go to a different team after you know, you've uh, gone through all, all the interviews. So, uh, and given that, you know, sometimes you go through all the jobs specs and you, you think, I don't actually fit in any of these, but I would still like to work with that company specifically. So I would like to know if it is possible to, you know, engage in a conversation with a recruiter and say, I don't have anything specific, but I'd like to work with you guys. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like that's probably primarily for us. Uh, yeah, so certainly, as I said earlier, uh, if you're an early stage career, then that's the path we'd recommend you go through uh, and just try and get into the company and get a role there. Uh, it may not be your passion, but the learning that you get early on from basically any job at a company that does uh, software engineering at a scale that you can't do at a school is going to teach you millions of things in a very short period of time. Uh, for more senior roles where you, where you have some expertise and background, uh, I believe it is possible, but in general, I would expect the first question would be, what kind of things are you interested in? Uh, and the best way to answer that is saying these kinds of jobs. Uh, what I will definitely say is if you do get through the interview process with a team, a lot of teams have kind of agreements uh, to transfer interview results between them. Uh, and that certainly matters when occasionally job posi like positions disappear in the time it like between when you apply for it and when the interviews are all completed, especially if we've flown you over for the interview. Like that can, that can happen where a job just, it, it vaporizes. It doesn't get filled by someone else. It just disappears. And then we will try and find another role that fits for you. Uh, that tends to be done kind of at the team level rather than at the recruiter level, uh, though the recruiters are involved. But it's, not a, it's very rare to have people kind of come in and say, anywhere is good, you know, help, help me choose. Uh, without that helping you choose being, let's put in some keywords to the search engine and, and help you choose that way. So I would still say start with the search engine. If you apply for 10 jobs through, through the career site, you'll end up with one recruiter. And they'll know that you're applying for 10 jobs. And they'll try and optimize that. They'll try and combine interview loops between teams so that you aren't doing 40 interviews uh, for 10 roles. They'll get that down. Um, and they'll try and like schedule them close to each other where they can't actually combine them. So we, we will do that, but definitely checking off all of the jobs that are of interest and you'll end up with the one that fits you best is the way to approach that, I would say. Thank you. Do you want to add anything to this? I'll keep talking. So yes, I think you know we're small enough. Our recruiting team is, is amazing. And it, even if you think about the way that we recruit in universities for, uh, again, early stage, as well as more tenured and senior roles. Um, our recruiting team is great because they will look to see kind of the broadest view possible. And we've had more than enough as a hiring manager, more than enough uh, resumes of people or uh, profiles that are sent over saying like, hey, this person actually uh, applied for this job, but we think uh, this person would actually be a better fit for this job. And there's always that constant uh, visibility and, and flow of communication within recruiting, but also uh, across all the uh, functional departments within MongoDB. So I think um, you also heard Jessica say uh, we uh, use Twitter. So tweet at us <laughs> if you're interested. But um, yeah, we absolutely will look to try and find the best fit. Because I think for recruiting, it's not just about necessarily us finding the best fit. It's a two-way conversation. We want to make sure this is a great place for you to come to so that we're not seeing you come on board for six months or 12 months or 18 months. We want this to be a really good fit um, for you as much as it is for us. So it's that two-way diligence process. And I think that comes just naturally for us to find the right uh, position um, for you. So, great. Thank you. So we have time for one very final short question with short answers. <laughs> Anyone? OK, so I think we can close uh, this uh, here. Let's thank all our sponsors that uh, took the time to participate. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for all of you to all of you for participating.